So the big question is this, how are real estate investors who don't have a ton of free time, don't have access to off-market deals, and didn't start life on third base? How do we grow a real estate business conservatively to support our families, finally leave the corporate rat race, and build a legacy? That is the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Ed Matthews, and this is Real Estate Underground. This is the Real Estate Underground podcast show number 65. Greetings and salutations, Real Estate Undergrounders. This is Ed Matthews with the Real Estate Underground podcast. Thank you so much for showing up today uh, and listening in. I'm uh, really excited about uh, this uh, this uh, uh, gentleman who we're about to talk with. Um, not only is he a real estate investor like you and me, but he's also uh, a technologist. And so, you know, near and dear to my heart, I, I, I say fellow geeks unite, me being one as well. And uh, my kids will tell you that I'm not, I am not a geek. I'm actually a full-blown dork. And uh, I, I resemble that re remark and I'm okay with it. So, um, you know, uh, Mike Kading with uh, Norhart Investments, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And it's really good to see you, my friend. How you been? Oh, I've been great. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so for those of us, you know, I've been stalking you online for, for quite some time and I've been blown away by uh, your success and, and all the things you have going on. And I can't wait to unpack that today. Um, but, uh, you know, for those of us out there that, that haven't met you yet, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your business and, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, I'm CEO of Norhart. We design, build, and rent apartments, but really we're focused on driving down the cost of housing. We're already achieving a 20 okay. to 30% reduction in cost, and we believe we can reach a 50% reduction in cost. But really? imagine, yeah, imagine what that means someday. It means someday your rent could be half, or your mortgage payment could be half. And that's the kind of energy and direction that we're headed as a company. Excellent. And so um, I would love to learn more about that. So let's let's talk about uh, the expense lines, you know, former, so technology wise, but I was a former procurement and sourcing guy, right? So uh, so I understand cost reduction as part of a business model. Um, mm. Now, are you talking about cost reduction in terms of construction, operations, yeah. both, something else? Primarily construction. If you look okay. at the past 60 years, things like agriculture has improved productivity by 1500%. Right. Manufacturing has been 760%. Do you have any guess what construction has done over the past 60 years? I have no idea. It's nothing. Well, it's Zip. 10%. Yeah. It's terrible, right? Right. If we just take the technologies and the innovations that these other industries have learned and apply it into construction, it's remarkable the impact that has. And so there's a variety of techniques that we take from those spheres. We're just copying what they've already learned and applied it in our space. We're having great success with that. So are you talking about just-in-time inventory? Are you talking about, you know, line manufacturing, like modular home, modular building? Is that what we're talking about? All of the above. Okay. Yeah. One of the really simple, like, starting points is in construction, all of the work is typically done by separate companies. So you right. have a different company that's the owner, different company that's a general contractor, subcontractors, suppliers, so on and so forth. Yeah. So one of the first things we did was take that all in-house. So everyone is under one roof. We have plumbers, we have developers, we have people finding new sites, we rent the properties out to people. We even have manufacturing facilities and supply chain wow. uh, groups. But bringing that all under one roof right there solve some problems because of the interplay between different companies. Right. But you can really start to do some fun things. For example, uh, we have a partnership with Toyota and at Toyota, they produce a car every 55 seconds. Now in our space in construction, we've applied some of the same techniques and we're now producing an apartment unit every five hours. And we wow. think we can get that down to two hours or even less. Now, what that does, it takes a 15-month project and drops it down to nine months. How do we do that? We use basically the assembly line. Instead of moving a product down a line, you move the workers through the building. And we break the building down into batches, and each team moves every five hours through the building. And so that's one example of the techniques that we use. Fascinating. But all the tools that you had earlier, we, we're using as well. So, so when you talk about teams, are you talking about 
you have an MEP team or do you break it down to electrical, plumbing, HVAC? Like how granular does that team building get? Yeah. Uh, so when, if you looked at our mass schedule, full geek there's on about a hundred and what was that? I said, I'm going to go full geek on you here. I want to hear every detail. Oh, I love it. We actually have like 120 tasks okay. that go into it. So they get pretty granular down to like each coat of paint in a unit yep. uh, when the cabinets get installed. So it's about 120 different tasks. Um, our teams, there's probably a dozen or so different teams and each team will, will subdivide their team into the different tasks that are involved. Okay. All right. So on a team particular, you'll have a uh an e2 or you know to be able to handle all the switches and outlets and and whatnot you'll have you know a carpenter to install cabinets and flooring and trim and all that is that that's what we're talking about so it's a multidisciplinary team uh yeah it can even be multi multidisciplinary oftentimes it's single disciplinary okay uh, to give you some example the carpenters are in the front end of all of this yeah. they have one team that sets the walls they have another team that sets the floor pods Okay. Uh, and even before that step, we have a factory that produces all of that is right. right in there with the whole schedule. Right. Fascinating. And so I'm, I'm curious, you know, it's a, it's a complex, well, it's, it's actually straightforward, but it's a very complex business model. Um, yeah. How did you figure this out? What's your background? Boy, uh, my education's in computer science, mathematics, and management. So right. not at all related, but my family originally started the business. So my dad started it okay. and it was a very small real estate company. Uh, it was, we only built a handful of apartment buildings at the time and my, I grew up with it. So day in and day out, I have <laughs> stories of us as a family trip, going to the local hardware store to <laughs> pack up eight different carts full of materials and then drive right. that off to the building. We were very scrappy. There was only a few of us working in each building, yeah. but uh, my dad really wanted me to join the business. And I really didn't want to. And the reason I didn't want to is I don't want people to think it was given to me. Right. So I had to really struggle through my own ego on that. But deep down, what I really wanted to do was make some kind of meaningful, positive impact on the world. And so getting past my own ego, I realized like, here's an opportunity to take this small business and grow it to that kind of level to make an impact in housing. Yep. And so I joined with my dad and Unfortunately, not long after um, we were working together, he passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, yeah, essentially overnight, um, I was leading this business. And there was an, I didn't know much, right? I, I was very inexperienced. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was some magic to that. Because our inexperience, our ignorance allowed us to start questioning everything. Sure. You know, why is it done this way? Right. Why can't we do it some other way? And then there was nobody to tell us no. Right. And so looking back at some of the risks and things we took on, I don't know if I would do again, but uh, because of that ignorance, we were able to push things forward and start down this journey to create the model that we have today. Wow. That's interesting. I'm sorry for your loss. Um, yeah. So, so in terms of so the focus has always been apartment buildings or have you applied this to like a, a build to rent um, type model or uh, single family homes as well? Yeah. So when it was a small family business, my dad got into single family homes, got into mini storage. Uh, oh, wow. okay. and as we've grown, we've realized that that's not the right strategy for us. Okay. We're trying to drive down the cost. And so if we want to drive down the cost, it's really hard to do that. Right. It's important to stay laser focused on one niche. Okay. And for us right now, that is multifamily. I can imagine someday once we feel like we've mastered that space, we could expand. But for today, it's enough work just to try to master that one space. I I, I can imagine, you know, and it it allows you to create, you know, that just in time inventory concept. You know, it allows yeah, you exactly. to have commonality with every unit, right? And you know, that's a branding opportunity as well as a manufacturing opportunity, right? Same cabinets, love, same sink. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I love that you brought up just-in-time inventory. What's really neat, so in a typical construction site, a, a lot of times they want to just bring out all the materials. So that's right. the initial thought. Like, bring it out so I don't need to worry about it. Right. You don't realize how much pro how many problems that causes. All the re-movement of that material, the damage that happens, and the result, you right. don't know where to go looking for the material. It's right. painful. 
Right. And so once you get to a point where you know literally where everyone is in a building down to a five hour window, you can start start now trickling the supplies just to the point at just which they need them. it. Right. It's it's Smart. pretty incredible. Wow. It's very hard to do. <laughs> and we're not always perfect at it, but it it's it's where we're headed. Yeah. Wow, you do it better than most. Even if you if you if it's not perfection, it, I guarantee you do it better than most builders because you know I'm in that business and I'm always looking for, you know, from an inventory perspective, you know, a um, and what I meant by branding is you know every every unit that we redo when we acquire a building or you know we're getting into development as well, you know you know it's a Clark Street building, right? The the flooring is yeah. the same, the lightings are are the same. You know the, the the cabinets, the the you know the bathrooms look the same, um, and it's you know there's a level of quality there that you know we wow. demand of our of our teams, uh, but I can't say that you know on the on the installation piece that we're efficient, right? I mean I think it's uh, I I probably adhere to the don't do it this way you know model where we drop everything, you know for that particular unit that that gets dropped and you know my guys are either searching for it or, or walking around it or moving it to be able to do their jobs. And so you've inspired me. I'm going to, I'm going to take a look at that part of our business now. Well, and in fairness, your model is way better than not having the materials, which is also a problem in this, in this true statement. Time. True statement. <laughs> well, you know, I, I also adhere to the, you know, having no plan having no plan or having a bad plan is better than no plan. Right. Yeah. I love how you thought about the design of your units though. Because one of the things we're doing now too is we get we're all the way down to the manufacturing space or supply chain directly with manufacturers across the world, yeah. both in Mexico and Asia. But you can start branding and designing like individual faucets to be exactly the way you want them. Yep. And so there's really cool stuff you can start doing in that space as well. Yeah. I think you have to probably get to a certain um uh throughput, right? Before that before a manufacturer is willing to do that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, in terms of the units that, that you're building on an annual basis, I mean, what, what do those numbers look like and what do you have under management these days? Yeah. Uh, we've been growing quite rapidly. So we're building at about 500 units a year right now, but that pace has been more or less doubling every year. So total number of units is only like a thousand. Yeah. Only that's a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it feels <laughs> all compared to how many we're producing. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it, 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 but the thing is, is that once you have the business model figured out, you know, scaling that model is, it's a different effort, but it's, it gets, I want to say easy, but it certainly becomes a little less complex, right? Systems yeah. or systems. You, you might think <laughs> the, the, the challenges in developing the business model are certainly huge, but yeah. scaling it is a whole nother beast. That's been a Absolutely. very interesting challenge over the years. Yeah. And so how are you, you know, you, you mentioned you're doubling year over year you know, how are you figuring out how to scale? I mean, going from building 250 units, even if that's one complex, right? And it may not be, um, yeah. to, you know, 500, that is a that is a gigantic jump in effort, right? So how are you scaling your systems to handle that? Yeah, you know, the, the first major issue was staffing, right? And at least in right. construction, it's really hard to find good staff members. Right. And we have a standard of which we look for staff that is basically our goal is to reach best in the world. And we will literally fly people in all over the country into work every single week. And we'll fly them home at the end of the week because they're wow. best at their niche or whatever they're right. doing. And so there's a whole world there we could talk about because that that is probably the most important lesson I've ever learned. But uh, so the first issue was just finding those people. And so what we ended up doing was hiring on, it was like, 15% of our staff at the time were recruiters. Right, sure. Just to go out and try to find all the little people. And then the next big lesson we learned as we started scaling at that speed is that just because you double your staff does not mean you double production. True. In fact, in some cases, <laughs> it hurts your production, right? Your productivity. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's um, there's a lot of challenges to solve in that space. And the other, the other interesting thing is we start, start scaling is we're adding new lines of production. So this past year, we now have steel wall panel production. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have precast concrete production. 
it is really hard ramping those things up because you got to get in there. You got to learn the problems. You got to start solving the problems. Sure. I think fundamentally what I've learned is you have to have enough great problem solvers. And then the number of new problems coming in have to be lower than the capacity of those people to solve the problems coming in. Cause I promise you, there's going to be a ton of problems. You just have to build the capacity to solve the problems fast enough. And that comes down to human capital without a doubt. Absolutely. Right? It's yeah. the people hands yeah. down, get yeah. the people right. It's the most important. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, we're in a very different business, although we're in the same business, we're in very, our business models are, are quite different. Although I I'm, I'm, I'm officially intrigued for sure about how to do it. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, but the, the culture that we build, the value chains that we build mm -hmm. here, uh, the way that we operate together as a cohesive team, um, that part I get. And, you know, and so our, like, probably like you, our, you know, our, our hiring mm -hmm. process is pretty rigorous, right? You know, I know, I know plenty of folks that have a role and if you can fog this mirror, the job's yours and I'll teach you everything you need to know. And that's just, uh, that doesn't work for us, right? It doesn't work at all. I mean, we, there was a point in our, uh, in our journey that, I didn't really understand that lesson many years ago. And we had a lot of temp labor to do work. And I can tell you that's a disaster. Don't do that. Right. Um, and it was someone much smarter than me came alongside and said, Mike, what are you, what are you doing here? Like you need to fight to find the very, very, very best people you can. There's this notion of talent density, which is the number of talented people you have in an organization. Yep. Typically over time, talent density declines because the smart founder might hire someone a little less smart or hire someone a little less smart. It's really hard to keep that standard high. Uh, but the goal of great companies should be to raise talent density with time. Yeah. If you can do that and do it well and to provide freedom and flexibility, it's a game changer. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty open about the fact if I walk into a team meeting uh, back in my technology days or, or especially here, and if I'm the smartest person in the room, we're in a lot of trouble. We are. Yeah. And I don't mean that to be humorous. Yeah. I mean, for real. Right. I mean, there's a reality mm -hmm. there that, uh, you know, I, it, because it puts one person in, in, you know, it positions one person as being responsible for problem solving. And that's not how you solve problems. Exactly. We, we talk a lot about uh, a notion called psychological safety. Google did a big study to find that that was the most important thing that spread their amazing teams from just their average teams. But that's, that's kind of right to your point though. You need smart people and you need an environment that's safe where people right. can challenge and bring up ideas. I often say, if you have, if you have any one of us battled out against a genius and a problem, that genius is going to win. Sure. If you take a team of competent individuals in a high functioning environment, the team is always going to win. But the I trick is you tap into the brain power of every single person on that team. If right. you don't do that, it won't work. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'll take, I'll take a room full of people with 130 IQs over a person with 160 IQ every day, every day, yeah. all day. Right. Absolutely. So, so let me ask you, you know, in terms of um, asset classes, you know, obviously multifamily uh, there's, you know, you, you said something that at the beginning that really struck a chord with me and that is uh, affordability of housing. Right. Yeah. And so tell me more about, your vision in terms of not only lowering your, your construction costs, which obviously, you know, a lot of people would say, Oh, wow, you're making a lot more money than I am, but I'm, that's not what I heard you say. Exactly. Yeah. For me, this might seem odd, but I really could care less about money. You know, my dad died at a relatively young age. And I think a lot about how short life really is. And I ask myself every day, like, what is the impact? What do, what do I want to do with the few moments I have here on earth? And for right. me, that's always been about making a positive impact. I could, yep. you're not going to, you know, you die with a bunch of cash around you. That doesn't help you at all. Right. And so for our business, the way I look at it, and we're unabashed about this, we do charge market rents for what we're doing. What we're doing then is we're taking that capital, the cash that we earn in each project, and we're pushing it into the production system the reason we're doing that is if I offered cheap rents today, because we could, that only solves housing affordability for a handful of people. Right. But if I take that profitability and put it into the system that's building the apartments, the factory that's building the buildings, and then scale that up nationwide, I can then solve housing affordability for the nation. 
And my goal is we're producing enough units at an, a high enough rate that supply and demand factors kick in. So much supply is hitting the market that the overall price comes down. To and it, over, and it, over, it washes over demand. I get it. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you know, it's, it's, you, you're at a, you're at a thousand units. You have about 3.8 million last I heard. Um, <laughs> so that, you know, thousand, two thousand, four thousand, six, uh, you've, you've got your work cut out for you, my friend, but you know, the, you could come to Connecticut and solve it in a matter of about three or four years. Cause we only have about 26,000 <laughs> units, uh, affordable housing that uh, need to be created between now and 2030. So plenty of time and yeah, come on, hop a plane. We'll, I'll buy you breakfast and then we can get to work. Sounds great. I love it. All right, man. Um, so, so let me ask you, you know, it, it seems like it, it feels like your father was a, 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 a loomed large in not only your formation as a, as an adult, but in a human, but also as a professional. And so, yeah. you know, that begs the question, you know, what was the best advice he ever gave you? Um, you know, in terms of either personal or if you want to share or, or professionally, you know, how did he, you know, what was, what was the foundation that he gave you that, uh, that has allowed you to create this amazing company? Yeah. You know, he really probably more than anything through his actions gave me a, a sense of drive and hard work. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe to a point that my mom would like regret it today a little bit, cause I'm tend to be a little too extreme at times. But growing up, it was, we were always trying to do something. We we're always building buildings. He was always pushing us to be at a higher level. And yeah. I really appreciate that because that helped me become who I am. Sure. I mean, I can even remember like just a young pipsqueak on the site and I would be running away from him, <laughs> trying to hide in a closet or what have you. He'd have me picking up nails and we'd be straightening them so that we could reuse those nails. Yeah. So that work ethic, he really instilled in, in me. Uh, and probably the second thing is frugality. Uh, okay. He produced buildings at a low cost in a very different way than we do today. But it was that like scrappiness. It was that we're in this, bringing my kids in, we're just doing what we need to do to make it right. happen. But uh, he kind of instilled that that value of trying to drive down costs in me just through a different method at the time. Interesting. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's funny, you were talking about straightening out nails and I had a similar vision of me and my dad when we were building yeah. stuff and, you know, he would make me as a little kid, I too was the one walking around, picking up the 10 panning nails and, you know, finding a tree stump or a, a cinder block and, you know, banging them out straight so that he could use them again. Right. Uh, that's funny. Wow. Exactly. That's an interesting vision. Um, you just turned me back into about a six-year-old in, in, in that comment. That was, that was really exactly. cool. Thank you. You've lived Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so, so in terms of, um, you know, as a leader, right. And, you know, you're leading a, 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 a large company that's growing really quickly. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I ask all of, all of our guests is, you know, and it, it kind of falls into the bucket of, you know, leaders tend to be readers. Right. And, oh, yeah. you know, I, I don't know that it means books anymore. Right. Because there's so many different media that you can you can you know take advantage of audiobooks and podcasts and videos on you know YouTube videos and um, obviously books and conferences and seminars and all that. So I'm curious, you know, how do you consume information and you know specifically who are you paying attention to these days to kind of sharpen your saw? Uh yeah, that's a great question. You know, you know, Tom Brady said if you want to perform at the highest level, you need to prepare at the highest level. Absolutely. And that's one of our core values. And for me, I'm a bit tenacious about this down to the point where literally every night I will come home and after we put the kids to bed, it is documentaries. And then I go to YouTube because there's so much you can learn on YouTube. Oh, yeah. uh, but I try to read a book a week, which sounds crazy, but you put it on audible or what have you, you listen to it on the car rides. You do it during your workout yeah. uh, and podcasts and um I will do master classes. So I will literally find people who are best in the world at a particular niche. Yeah. And we'll we'll fly them out here to the company. We'll uh, sometimes plead with them to come out and um, learn from them, which has been fantastic. Uh, one of my favorite books is No uh, No Rules Rules by Reed Hastings. It's the story oh, okay. of Netflix. Yeah. His view on freedom and responsibility has been fantastic. Um, but yeah, it, it almost doesn't matter like where you go learn. The the key there is you're pouring a ton of time and energy into learning. Right. 
because we all start off terrible in anything right. we try. It's a, it's an iteration, it's growth. And if you don't have a tenacity to want to learn and grow, you're not going to become best in the world at what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a profound point because, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember the gentleman who said it. I was, I was, I was at a conference and he, well, anyway, I'll remember his name, but yeah. um, he was, he was saying, uh, you know, when you go to start something, first off, you're going to be uncomfortable. And that discomfort is growth. That's what it feels like, right? But here's the reality. You're going to suck at it. And then you're going to do it again. And you're going to suck a little less. And eventually you're not going to suck at all. You're actually going to get pretty good at it. And it takes time. But it also takes, as you said, tenacity, right? You have to want to learn. You've got to be able to, uh, you know, continue to, um, the day I think I've, I know everything I need to know, I'm cooked, right? And I'm sure you feel the same way. And, uh, oh yeah, I've had so many instances through my life where I try something new. I was so bad at it that everyone said, "Don't do it." Right? I can do it again. And you're like, "Okay, I'm a little less bad, a little less right. bad, a little less bad." The key is, is the first time you do it, you know you're going to be bad at it. Don't absolutely don't, embrace that. Don't believe. Don't make that part of your psyche. Don't believe right. that's who you are. This right. is where you are in the journey today. Right. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about, you know, you have a podcast that you're, you're beginning to produce and, and I was telling you, you know, it, it takes, you know, a lot of episodes to kind of start to find your voice and figure out and get comfortable and figure out the message you want to send. And, um, you know, I, and so the way I, I combated that is I never listened to those first 20 or so episodes. I don't think I ever listened to them because I didn't want to get in my head. Right. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, but, you know, now I, you know, I feel like, um, yeah, opinions vary, but I feel like, you know, there's a comfort level there. And now, you know, we're trying to learn more and expand and, and you know, expand our, our guests and the type of things we were talking about. I mean, heck, yesterday I was talking about RV parks. Today I'm talking <laughs> about just-in-time inventory and, and, uh, and, you know, manufacturing efficiency, manufacturing efficiencies and as it applies to our business. And, you know, I, 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 you know, one of the cool things about having a podcast and you're going to learn this is mm. that, um, you can trade, uh, an audience for, or, you know, trade access to a platform and an audience to meet some really smart, really interesting, highly successful people that, you know, if I picked up the phone and called one of them, they may not return my phone call, but they'll come on yeah. my podcast. Right. And yeah. you know, I find that interesting. And you're a classic example of this, right? I mean, the, the reason we're meeting, yeah, yes, I, I stalked you online for a little while. And, you know, I tend to do that. I tell all my guests that I've been stalking them online because it's true I have. Because one of the ways <laughs> that I learn is by, you know, looking at, you know, trying to identify, you know, the people who really understand this business and they're doing mm -hmm. it at a very high level. And then, you know, I try to see what I can glean from them in terms of, you know, the videos they put out and the podcasts or, you know, articles and all that. And, you know, once I think I start to have my head around, okay, you know, this person is way smarter than me. I'd love to learn from them. Um, that's when I, I start knocking on your door and begging you to come on the podcast. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you were gracious enough to come here. So thank you for that. But, you know, man, yeah, thanks, I, I got to tell you. It's um, so I mentioned, uh, you know, you have an upcoming podcast. I'd love to hear more about yeah. that, given your perspective on the industry. Yeah, we're creating a podcast called Becoming a Unicorn. It's about the journey of small companies growing to billion dollar enterprises. Yeah, uh, We're going to start by opening ourselves up and showing a little bit about that journey that has been like for us. We're at about a $200 million valuation today. And it's, uh, you get to see what that journey is like, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But yeah. we'll also be interacting with other guests and other companies that have been on that same journey. And we'll explore what their journey was like and what we can learn from it as well. Excellent. Wow. I look forward to that. And so um, have you, is this on the schedule yet? Are you, are you, uh, are you at the point where you're going to announce a, 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 an episode one, or are we still a few weeks or months away from that? Yeah, so we don't have an announcement date yet, but we've recorded a ton of episodes. Actually, very much to your point, if, you, if you've ever seen uh, or read the book uh, from Pixar, Creativity, Inc., I did. they talk in that oh, book oh, about how oh. the first version of every film is terrible, and then like, yep. you edit it and change it again. It's better and better and better. Yep. That's the journey we're going on right now behind the scenes. Sure. It's kind of like your first 20 podcasts. We're, we're right. creating all those first 20 episodes now to yes. get to the, the really good ones. 
Yeah. And so, um, but over the next couple of months, we hope to have it launched. You can visit our website, norhart.com, N-O-R-H-A-R-T.com. And there's a place there you can sign up to uh, just get notified with updates of the podcast. Consider me one of your future subscribers. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, it's Love interesting. It. Um, you know, I you're you're choosing to record and refine and get it right, um, it, it, you know, in your own lab, right? Uh, yeah. I, I'm more of a, you know, head first, let's ready, ready, fire, aim kind of guy. So I did it in public and, you know, hopefully I didn't uh, embarrass myself too much, but, um, but the, uh, you know, it's, it's all good either way. It's fine. Uh, but the, you know, the fact is, is that, uh, you know, it does take some time to find your voice and and get it right and make sure that, you know, the message that you intend to send out, um, is resonating with your audience. So Mm. I, I congratulate you on that. Um, so Mike, the other thing that you had talked about, you know, given that you have refined your business process to such a, um, such a fine point, um, I'm curious, do you also, you know, what, what is, what is technology, you know, what role does technology play in your business? And, you know, is that something else that you're thinking about sharing with, uh, with the audience? Yeah. Uh, technology is really a key part. In fact, my, you know, my degree is in computer science. So I kind of look at the whole business from a technological standpoint. We have a team of software developers on staff that work on technologies for our business. A lot of them are technologies that support the behind the scenes systems that we built out. Um, But some of the uh, forward facing stuff that's kind of fun is the work on smart home technology or Mm -hmm. Apple hasn't totally allowed this yet, but we want it so that your Apple Watch can open every door to the buildings. And so the hardware is all there. We got some software that we're we're waiting for Apple to release. Wow, but, that would be cool. Um, yeah, there's, there's just cool experiences like that you can start to build into uh, the experience for the resident. But Excellent. the big goal of technology is not to be some flashy thing. Right. It's to remove the minor friction points out of your life. Right. That's what we try to do then. Excellent. And so, you know, one of the things I, I seem to recall is that you have a technology platform that you're you're building for uh, other investors as well. Is that right? It's well, it's for investors to invest within Norhart, but it's gotcha. Norhart Invest. One of the things we looked at over the past year is uh, could we replace the bank? And so we actually looked into if we could actually create our own bank. And we talked with some of the foremost experts on it fascinating. If you want to learn about creating a bank, it's you can do it. The challenge was for us is you, you can't invest too much of the bank's assets into your own deals. Right. So that was re- regulation that we couldn't get past. So instead, right. we're going down the SEC approval route and we're creating, it's not a bank, not at all, not FDIC insured, but there are accounts that people can put money into, earn a rate of return and return and get money uh, back out of it. You can also lock funds in for a period of time, maybe right. six months, maybe a year, maybe two years. Sure. But what's neat about it now is you as the investor will get the bank's, uh, the bank's profits. So we give you all the interest and then all the profits and stuff on top of that. It's sort of an, an, another neat idea to remove, uh, remove those barriers for investors. What we find is most uh, Americans are excluded from the real estate market. Right. Most of the real estate deals are only for accredited investors. Right. And that's primarily because it's a way easier approach for companies to get investment through accredited investors. Right. Um, but instead, we're taking a different approach. Uh, we're doing what's called a Reg A, which is one step shy of a fully public company. Yeah. And that enables us then to allow all investors, all, all Americans to invest in a platform like this. Interesting. Interesting. And so... Uh, Reg A, it's uh, I, the first time I'd ever heard of that. It was uh, Grant Cardone's uh, oh, yeah. new new. Uh, I, I, he calls it a fund, but it's it, but I understand what you're saying. It's not really. It is a fund, but not really. Yeah. Um, and so the you know so in terms of getting involved with this, so you know in turn, is there any sort of um, requirements from you know, let's say I'm Ed Matthews, not accredited investor, and I live in, you know, Chichi Castanenga, Kansas, right? And so um, what, uh, you know, what would I have to, to prove to provide to you in order to be able to participate in this kind of vehicle? Yeah, we want to make it really, really easy. So we want to make it as easy as signing up for an online bank account. 
Uh, there are a couple of added requirements because of SEC rules. Yeah. In particular, uh, if you're a non-accredited investor, you can't invest more than 10% of your net income or uh, 10% of your net assets. Okay. And so I think that's just a prudent rule. Regardless, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. So I actually kind of like that rule, but there's an additional check for things like that in the platform. Okay. But other than that, you'll just, it's not launched yet, but once it is launched, you just go on, sign up. And within a matter of minutes, you'll be able to put money into an account. And and then, so, and I'm asking this, I'm asking this because of me, but um, but I'll probably yeah. for my audience as well. Um, the, you know, in terms of, uh, getting money in and out of this type of um, financial product. Uh, you, you said that there's some sort of um, ability to, to re, is like a redemption period every six months. Um, is there, or is there other ways to pull the money in and out if, if you need it? You know, car needs new tires. Yeah, so, what do I do, right? <laughs> yeah, so it actually connects up with the other bank accounts. And so it just okay. can take money in and out of those other bank accounts. Uh, and then for the base account that you can put money into, you can take it out whenever you want. There's no restriction on the time. Now the interest on that is not going to be as good. Sure. But you can then lock it for whatever period you want. So say you don't need the money for three months, lock it for three months and you get a much higher rate of return or you could lock it for a year. If you don't need it, you get even more rate of return. Uh, it's really your choice. Uh, it provides you, the investor, the flexibility to do what's right for you. And you get more higher interest the longer you lock it for. Yeah, and it also probably uh, inspires and and causes uh, some urgency on your end as well because you've got to keep that money moving in order to satisfy and fulfill those commit those interest commitments, right? Yeah, exactly. We're basically monitoring it's called monitoring durations. Yeah. So we we monitor and look at where we're putting the money to match it up with the duration of the the time periods that putting they're putting right. their investors are putting the money in. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I'll tell you, this has been uh, an education and a half. Um, so I'm curious about, you know, you mentioned you have a family. Um, so when you are not uh, working your business and you're not, um, you know, saving everyone from the affordable housing crisis, uh, you know, what do you like to do? How do you spend your time? Uh, my kids. Yeah. <laughs> I got two daughters. Uh, one is uh, two, one is four, just about to turn five or this week. Wow, happy uh, birthday. But, uh, yeah, well, just just a few days ago, my little two-year-old comes up to me. She goes, Emma Hamburger, Emma Hamburger, Emma Hamburger. And what that means is she wants me to take her up on the table, lay her down. She lays flat on her back. And I uh, kind of move my hands up and down. <laughs> Slice and dice her. <laughs> she it. so it's just, I'm at that stage of life that they're so cute. They're so fun. Uh, and I just enjoy them so much. So I too am a I too am a father of daughters. I have a twenty year old and a fifteen year old. Okay. And neither of them will let me do hamburger with them anymore, but uh, <laughs> because it's not cool anymore. But uh, but you know they it gets even better. It's the best thing you'll ever do, and uh, you know yeah. enjoy every minute because you'll blink, and that two year old will be fifteen and you know looking to go out to the movies and and uh, that too is wonderful. But it's you know I, those early years are a lot of fun. Yeah, that's what I'm enjoying right now. Yeah, well, good, good. Congrats and enjoy and happy birthday to your daughter. Yeah, thank you. um, yeah. So, so Mike, um, you, you know, this has been a this has been an enlightening conversation to say the least. And thank you again. Mm. So, if people want to learn more about you or Norhart um, or any of your products, uh, you know, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah, you can visit our website at norhart.com. That's N-O-R-H. ART.com. If you click on invest, you can learn about the investments. If you click on podcast, you can learn about the podcast and just learn generally about our website and uh, even our social handles are all on there. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Mike Kading from uh, Norhart Investments. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. And uh, I'm grateful for not only your uh, your insights, but uh, but also you've inspired me to take a hard look at how we're building our own units. and. Uh, Hopefully I can uh, hop a plane someday and come pick your brain for a little while. Oh, that'd be so much fun. Thank yeah, you I'll so much. I'll buy the for coffee me. and lunch. Ah, even better. All right, cool. So uh, Mike, thanks again. Thanks. This has been the Real Estate Underground Podcast, a Clark Street Capital presentation. Thanks for joining us. 
If you're enjoying the show, please remember to subscribe and share it with your friends. If you'd like to learn more about Clark Street Capital and our upcoming projects, please join our investor club at clarkst.com slash join. Until next time, happy investing.